I think it's recording. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Stein. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Genetics and in the Neuroscience Center. Um, so our lab focuses generally on how genetic variation influences the structure and development of the brain. Um, the reason that we're interested in, in this is um, there are three billion base pairs in the human genome. If you modify or change some of those base pairs, base pairs you can influence the development of the brain and can lead to uh, risk for psychiatric diseases. Um, sometimes you can edit just one of those individual base pairs and you can create a huge effect on brain structure and leading to risk for the disease. Uh, other times you edit many of those different uh, base pairs and then you can lead to uh, uh, subtle changes that, that exist in the brain, each of which when added up create risk for psychiatric diseases. So um, one of the goals that we have is just to image uh, brains when we modify genetics. And we can modify those genetics um, using mouse models. So uh, that's the most common way of studying how genetic variation impacts brain structure. Um, and we can also use inherent genetic variation that exists in humans. Um, so we can get post-mortem human brains and then uh, see how genetic variation that exists in all of us uh, impacts the structure of the brain. So our interest in doing VR is just the brain is sort of inherently 3D and inherently sort of complicated to understand in just uh, serial 2D slices, which is generally the way it's viewed. So uh, we were working on this technology, which I'm going to tell you about, which allows us to view every cell, basically, in the mouse brain, starting in the mouse brain. Um, and then we wanted to have a way of, of visualizing that, and that's how we got into doing virtual reality. Um, we are very new at doing virtual reality, and I'm sure many of you are much more experts uh, than us, so I uh, really welcome your feedback on, on the work that we're doing. Um, and also, we're recruiting, so if you are a, an undergraduate computer science major, for example, and you're interested in doing this type of work, please, please find me afterwards. So this is just an example image. This is not a human brain. This is a mouse brain, and the top is sort of the top of the brain. The bottom is the bottom, um, and it's what we call a coronal slice, so going through the slice like this. And each of these individual dots is a nucleus, uh, is a nucleus, so it indicates that there is a cell there. And they're color-coded by the depth in the slice. So this is just an example of one of the images and showing, you know, just at the basic level, sort of the complication, um, the, the complicated nature of how many cells there are in the brain. So there's many ways to image uh, brains. You can image brains with MRI. Uh, that's at uh, around millimeter resolution. Um, so the advantages of doing MRI research are that you can image live human samples and it doesn't hurt them at all. Um, so uh, this is really great, but the disadvantage is that you have millimeter resolution and a cell is on the order of a micron. So you're not really measuring the basic unit of biology, which is the cell. Um, the next technique has been around for a long time, is light microscopy. So light microscopy allows you to image uh, at micrometer resolution, at the, at the sort of resolution of the cell. Um, and we can do this with fluorescence light microscopy. We can, we can image fluorescent, fluorescently labeled samples. Um, and we have dyes and antibodies that allow us to label specific cell types or, or the extent of all the processes of given cells. So um, light microscopy, uh, we do all, uh, yeah, almost exclusively on uh, post-mortem samples. So you have to be dead for this one. You don't have to be dead. <laughs> So, and then there's also electron microscopy, which is even a thousand-fold uh, higher resolution, so nanometer resolution. So there are features of neurons like spines, uh, which are, are the connections between two different neurons, that we can image uh, really, really, really well with electron microscopy, that we're sort of at the border of imaging with light microscopy. Um, very top part of the mouse cortex, just one little part there. So we want to measure the entire... brain because we want to see uh, what differences happen regardless of where, you, what location you are in the brain. So how has this previously been done? So um, previously, in order to uh, look at uh, light microscopy images, uh, what you have to do is take a brain sample and slice it into serial sections. And so you cut up those serial sections, then you image each section, and then you can computationally put them back together again. So um, the good parts about this is that it works, and it's been working for quite a while. The bad parts is that you get sort of these edge effects that you can sort of see. Um, this is a 3D reconstruction of these put back together again. But you definitely see like where the slices were um, beforehand. And this is also very slow because you have to slice very carefully 
um, stain each section image, slice very carefully, stain each section image. So recently there's been new technology that's, um, that's happening called tissue clearing technology. And so tissue clearing technology um, tries to uh, prepare a sample in a way that you can image the sample as intact without slicing it. Okay? So the main problem with imaging uh, an intact sample is that lipids prevent light from going through that sample. So in order to image the sample with light microscopy, you have to have light, you have to send light through the sample. So lipids, like the cell membranes, um, prevent light from going through that sample. So what this tries to do is to keep proteins intact, and those proteins are what we want to image, but remove the lipids. So the technology works by putting a hydrogel matrix. Um, so this hydrogel matrix is basically uh, proteins that are sort of in a lattice um, that go into the sample. And then you wash away with soap all of the lipids. Oh, sorry, I forgot to explain. So you have the hydrogel matrix, and then you fix all the proteins where they inherently were to the hydrogel matrix, and then you wash away the lipids. And surprisingly, most of the proteins stay intact, and all you're left with is a clear sample that you can then send light through and image where the proteins are, which is what you usually are interested in. So here's just an example of the way this looks. So this is uh, before uh, tissue clearing, and obviously you can't see through the brain, and then after tissue clearing. Hmm. And this is a famous quote from Ramon E. Cajal about the brain is, consist is a world consisting of a number of unexplored continents and great stretches of unknown territory. <laughs> so I think the, the authors there are really you know, sort of clever to, to do this. So uh, we didn't invent these techniques, uh, but we're just implementing them. We're using them in our lab to study how genetic variation impacts brain uh, development and brain structure. So this is now work from our lab. Um, this is an example of what the tissue clearing looks like. So there you can sort of see the outlines of the brain. So we have cleared the brain, removed the lipids from the brain. Um, we image these brains using what's called uh, light sheet microscopy. So light sheet microscopy sends a beam of light through the sample and then has another, uh, has an objective here where you image all the light coming out. And this is very quick. The advantage of this type of microscopy, it's, it's very quick compared to um, other microscopy where you sort of look at each point individually. So after we do this, we can uh, take pictures of the brain and we can take pictures of uh, different types of, of uh, proteins or nucleic acids that exist in these cells in the intact structure of the brain. So here's an example of taking a picture of, of nuclei. So this is a stain that marks all the nuclei in the brain. This is a stain that marks only a subset of, of uh, proteins that exist. It's called, Cux1 is the name of the protein, and it's only found in a type of neurons called upper layer neurons. And CTIP2 is a stain that only is found in lower layer neurons, so the, uh, the lower layers in the cortex. And here's them on the, same, uh, on the same image. So what this allows us to do is to image basically where every cell is in the brain, where only <coughs> certain subtypes of cells are, um, and then we can compare between uh, different like wild type and knockout brains. And so here's how we do this. So we are working uh, with a knockout uh, mouse model. So this is a topoisomerase conditional knockout, which we know is involved in like the survival of neurons. So this is a wild type. It's a mouse brain where um, there has been no genetic modifications done to this mouse. And this is a knockout where we have a genetic modification. We remove a gene from this mouse. Um, and you can see uh, here are the images of one hemisphere and another hemisphere uh, from these different mice. Um, the, the brightness is based on the density of nuclei. So this is a nuclear stain. You are imaging every nucleus in the brain. Um, and you can see first there's just global differences in the brain. So there's, you know, the wild type is much bigger than the conditional knockout. But we're also able to see the individual cell types that are different between wild type and knockout. So the, this is at the, far, the sort of highest uh, zooming out that we can do. But this is at the most local, the zooming in as much as we can. Um, and so you can actually see individual nuclei here, um, both in regions of the cortex and regions of the hippocampus, which is sort of a subcortical structure. The hippocampal regions are much, um, there's much more nuclei in those, much higher density of nuclei. So this is a movie to give you guys an idea of what these brains look like. So this is an intact mouse brain sample um, that we imaged. So this is the front of the mouse brain where the nose is. Um, these are the sides of the mouse brain. Um, this is um, the barrel cortex where the um, sort of the sensation from the, the whiskers are. And so you can see differences there. And then it's going to zoom in, and you're going to be able to see every individual nucleus throughout the brain. 
So you can see in structures like this, VR becomes useful, I think, I hope. Um, because, uh, you know, to, to do these type of movies becomes like a whole thing. You gotta, you gotta put it in, you gotta like make, you gotta know where you're gonna send the, um, the slices in and out. So having the ability to just walk through this, to, to label individual regions, to count the number of cells within individual regions, um, we think will be very useful, we hope will be very useful. Okay, and so here's just an example of sort of one of the biological questions we're try trying to answer, which is, um, how do the cell types change um, in wild type versus this gene that we're interested in? Where when we remove this gene, there seems to be a complete absence of this layer five uh, neuron. So it's a one specific neuronal subtype, and we wanted to see, um, you know, does that extend to the entire cortex, or is that only in a specific region of the cortex? So um, using tools, we're trying to count the number of cells that exist in the, in the entire brain, count the number of cells in different um, in different regions and then count the number of cells of a given type that express these individual proteins and compare them between wild type and not type. Okay, so um, in order to count cells, which is a very basic operation, um, you have to you know, somehow delineate what is a cell versus what is not a cell. Um, so in order to, to delineate what is a cell versus what is not a cell, um, you have to take these unlabeled raw images, which are not, uh, you know, there's, there's noise in the raw images, and they look like this. And you have to label them. You have to say what is a cell versus what, are not, what is not a cell, and that's what the colors are here. So um, uh, I have several undergraduates in the lab, Selene, Jessica, Zach, who are all working on this. Um, and it takes about one to four, probably more than four minutes, to trace each individual nucleus in 3D, because you go through each slice one by one to trace each individual nucleus. So obviously, to count all of the nuclei uh, in the mouse brain, the 100 million nuclei in the mouse brain, it's going to take 207 years for one undergraduate to manually do it. <laughs> and then if we, you know, if we gather together all of the undergraduates here at UNC, it would take uh, 3,000 of them working at 10 hours per week um, to, to do this. So obviously we need, uh, you know, uh, automated methods for doing this. And this is what uh, Gurong has been working on. And we've been working together with him on this, which is to um, use those automated cell segmentations to train a machine learning algorithm to recognize all the nuclei in the brain. And so here's just some examples of this. Um, so here's manually delineated, and here's um, what uh, Gurong's algorithm has done. Um, and so um, here's what the ground truth is, and this is uh, Gurong's algorithm here. So if the nuclei are very far apart from each other, we're really, you know, it doesn't really matter which method you use, it's pretty easy to, to delineate the nuclei. Uh, everybody works pretty well. But the more uh, dense the nuclei get, the closer the nuclei are, are to each other, um, you know, Here's the ground truth, and uh, Gurong's algorithm does actually really well, but it's actually, it, it still even has problems separating nuclei that are very close together. So the way to solve this in machine learning is to get more training samples, more and more training samples. Well, like I said, it takes so long to get these training. Okay, so now just a little bit about what the VR stuff that we're doing uh, is. So Zach presented over there, and feel free to, to go over afterwards to uh, look at what he's doing again. So this is just some of the initial stuff that we did. Uh, we took uh, an image of uh, some tissue, um, some mouse brain tissue. This is like sort of half a hemisphere. Um, then we like binarized the image. So this is a very sort of simplistic way of, of finding where cells are, just sort of using a threshold and saying uh, if a cell exists there or not. And then loaded in, into a game engine called Unity which you guys may be familiar with. So this is uh, like a video game engine, but works really well with the Oculus. Um, so this was just sort of our first implementation. Um, and then, you know, I don't know if this is useful to you guys, but for when I show this to people who are, have not used these things before, that this is you know what the VR uh, looks like and sort of going into the VR, and then um, so we haven't actually done too much work uh, with the mouse brain. We've actually started with the human brain because it took us uh, about a year to be able to acquire these mouse brain images at cellular resolution because there's all kinds of sort of intricacies of learning how to do this. And so now we actually have that, and Gurong's program is working, so we're uh, ready, and Zach is working on now loading in the mouse images. But until then, we were working on loading in human images. So this uh, data is from a human MRI, 
um, and is the surface of the human uh, cortex. So this is not at cellular resolution, this is much bigger resolution. Um, but we can use this to, to basically use it as just an anatomy learning tool. So that's the initial thing that we were trying to do. So we put in all of these different regions, we labeled them differently. You can go in, uh, select the region using a laser pointer, move it around a little bit, learn which of the regions are, and I think you even get to hear Zach's voice saying what the, <laughs> what the region is. So just a, a basic anatomy learning tool to start off. But soon we're moving to uh, putting in the mouse cortex uh, into, the, into the structures here. Okay, so uh, that's pretty much what we're working on. So I want to thank the people that are doing all the work here. So mainly Ole Kupa has been leading all of these tissue clearing um, uh, experiments, you know, going through, figuring out what, uh, how to do all this tissue clearing, imaging at cellular resolution, handling these very large image data sets, which can be like 500 gigabytes per image, um, up to a terabyte per image. Um, uh, Rose is uh, new working on these tissue clearing uh, projects, and Zach has actually been leading all of the VR stuff, so he's done all the VR stuff by himself. Um, and then, of course, I think Gurang, who's going to talk to you next, um, who's, been, uh, who's been leading all of the cell segmentation parts that, that we've been doing. So, so uh, with that, I think I'll let Gurang talk, and I'll, we'll take your questions after. Do you need this yeah. one? Yeah. Right. <laughs> How do you? Uh, yeah. Just just hit exit show. I think so. Yeah. yeah.